Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on, and actually I think bring to a conclusion our look at that Valley of Allah, the conflict in the Valley of Allah. Uh, we, this is our, our fourth session, so it'll be a four-week four study. And again, I want to remind you, if you have questions about it, if you'd like notes, you know, they're not, they're not formal or anything, but if you'd like questions or comments about the study, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. If you're blessed by the study, we ask that you share it with others. Absolutely, okay? yes. Pass right. the word along. Yeah. The word of God needs to go forth from as many places as possible. That's right. Uh, these are the days that Amos was talking about when we're beginning to truly see a famine for the hearing of the word of God. Yes. Okay. So let's get together. Let's get together. Shout it from the rooftops. Hallelujah. All right. We left off last week, and I'm going to reread verses. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 17, which is basically the account of the battle in the Valley of Law, the conflict between that winds up between David and Goliath. Uh, we left off last week in verse 49 and 50. So I want to reread that before we start. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Brother Mark if you will ask God's blessing on our time together. Oh, oh Lord, we thank you that you're in our midst. Just guide us through this study to get out of it what you determine that we should get out of it. And we praise you. And we thank you for your word. Amen. 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 So, again, we're, we're glad you can be with us, and we just want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, so 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to read verses, and these are the verses we left off, as I said last week, 49 and 50. Mm -hmm. And David put his hand into his bag and took from it a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. He threw a stone. He threw a rock. I promise you what. The rock of my salvation, the rock of our salvation. So that's where we left off. And verse 51 goes on to say, Then David ran and stood over the Philistine. And took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and, and killed him, cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. They, they turned and they ran when they saw Goliath was dead. You know, remember recently, I think in the last study or the study before that, we were looking at Psalm 3715, where David wrote, and this is a little later in, in history, all right, that the enemy's sword would be the very weapon used for his destruction. I was going to ask you about that, because I remember you had talked about that once before. Yeah, about. yeah. That's why it makes a point to the yeah. fact that David went onto the battlefield with no sword in his hand. Right. But at the end, what he did was he took Goliath's sword, the one that Goliath had brought out there so boastfully, and chopped off his head with it. That's what he did. And where right? is that? Psalm 37, 15. Mm. You know, I, I want you to try and understand that that's not an uncommon thing in the Word of God, okay? Mm -hmm. That the enemy comes against us and has his plan, but, well, we'll see God towards it, right? Yes, he does. The weapon that the enemy would use against us will become or can become his downfall. Mm -hmm. I think one of the great instances of that is, if you remember in the book of Esther, uh, during the time of the Persian yes. rule of Ahasuerus, when his viceroy, Haman, mm -hmm. plotted to destroy all the Jews. Remember that? Yes. Okay. Yes. So let me just read this from Esther, chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs who were before the king, said, Behold, indeed, the gallows standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king. And the king said, hang him on it. Yes. So they hanged Haman on the gallows, which he had prepared for Mordecai. And the king's anger subsided. You see, Haman hated the Jews. So he builds these gallows 
because he wants to destroy Mordecai, who is the, the leader of the Jews there, right? Because his plan is to destroy all the Jews. But the gallows that he built who became the gallows he was hung on. Mm -hmm. And it all started because one guy didn't show him the proper respect. Well, for, and, it, and it was pride in his life. Uh, I'm going to talk more about the fact that it, can all, it all starts with one guy. Okay? So, the, the plot to destroy Israel, the Philistines, okay, then with the Persians, there's been a lot of plots to destroy Israel and the people of God, all right? And they all fail. God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, and he said, devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand, for God is with us. The enemy plots against you. The enemy plans against you. That's the nature of uh, that kind of satanic enemy. But God says it'll be thwarted. It'll be turned. And you know what? It'll be turned on them. Have you never heard? Have you never heard from Romans chapter 8, verse 28? And we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Not some. No, Not all. Many. So when the enemy devises a plan, God's going to turn that for your good. That's right. This is this is a conclusion that we have to come to. Mm -hmm. This has to be where our faith leads us, where the word of God, which was written for our instruction, brings us to that place that we know, regardless whether somebody plans good for us or somebody plans bad for us, mm -hmm. God is in control. Yes, he is. And he will turn it to good. <clears throat> So in verse 52, it goes on. Now, get, you get that picture. Now, David has run out into the battlefield. He had faced this giant. He had faced this monster. He goes out with nothing, no armor, no helmet, no shield. He goes out with a, a sling. And there is now is lying Goliath dead on the battlefield with his head chopped off. So it says, now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the valley and to the gates of Akron, and, to, and the slain Philistine lay along the way to Sherarim, even to Gath and Ekron. By the way, that, that's basically saying that, that covers the entire land of the Philistines. So now that David has gone out into the field as a champion mm -hmm. and defeated their champion, now all of a sudden that army of the people of God that have been standing there for 40 days doing nothing, well, maybe shouting war cries, all right? Now they run onto the battlefield and they pursue the Philistines and they chase them all the way back home. All right. Mm -hmm. David, one man who trusted in the Lord, a young faithful man filled with the word of God, filled with the love of God and willing to act, inspired the entire army of God to action. It's pretty amazing. It may only take one. Yeah. Okay. How many, how many people does it take to get God into action? Just one. Just one. You know, when I was thinking about this and I was praying about this, I thought of a movie that I had mentioned once before quite some time ago. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's called Hacksaw Ridge. Yes. I believe you've seen that too, right? I, I rarely ever recommend movies to anybody. But if you've not seen that, uh, and you want to see movies, go see Hacksaw Ridge. You can it's get the DVD. It's the, the story of Hacksaw Ridge. It's not the story of Hacksaw Ridge. It's the story of a man. Mm -hmm. And it's a great story. It's the true account of one man. Yes. His name was Desmond Doss. He was a believer. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is during the Second World War. Who refused to go on the battlefield carrying a weapon to kill. Right. He would not pick up a weapon, okay? And the story is about the incredible persecution he faced from within his own men, within the American army because of that. He wouldn't carry a weapon to kill, but he volunteered to go into bloody battle as a combat medic armed with nothing other than his trust in the Lord. That's right. It's amazing. And absolutely amazing. Okay. And but think about that. He, he wouldn't, he refused, he, he was a believer, and because of that, 
He would not carry a weapon. He said he was not going to go into battle to kill, but he would go in as a medic to heal. Mm-hmm. Okay. He wanted to bring life. Well, he did because he was responsible for saving the lives of 75 soldiers in the Battle of Okinawa. Okay. During the Second World War. Not, not only American. Hey, no, he actually did save uh, one or two Japanese. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. So here's a man. He went onto the battlefield and he saved 75 lives. He was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, which is the highest honor that you can receive in the military, in, in the American military, mm-hmm. by far. I mean, that's, that, that is the highest honor, mm-hmm. not given lightly, okay? Well, so here's one man who changed it. I mean, if you see this story, it's, it just absolutely is incredible because he inspired the American soldiers who were fighting a terrible, terrible battle. Yes. You say it was rated R. It was a bloody Horrible, oh, horrific see. battle that went mm. on. There's nothing pretty about it, okay? War is not pretty. Not, in, not at all. There's an old saying, war is hell. Well, it certainly is a, a form of hell, mm. okay? But one man, with David, it was one man who went out and did that. In Hacksaw Ridge, it was one man who inspired that entire, whatever it was, division or, you know. Uh, it wasn't a platoon. It was a lot more men than oh, I okay? okay? <clears throat> now, I want to tell you that, that the word says, and it is still true, two are better than one for their labor, mm-hmm. for the, whatever the task, task is at hand, because that's what it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, right? But it may take one to make the spark that will light the fire in others, mm. or many others. That's what happened with David. Like that song, it only takes a spark to make a fire Because remember... The, the Israelite army had been there for 40 days, and they hadn't moved against the That's Philistines. Right. But when David went on the battlefield, it created a spark that ignited this incredible victory for the, for the uh, Israelites. So I, I want to caution you to understand that ultimately this is not about the greatness of one person, whether we're talking about David or Desmond Das, okay? Mm-hmm. It's about God working through one who is a willing servant, who is not seeking his own glory, but the glory of God. Yes. Was that not true of David? Yes. Was it, did he not holler at the end? The reason he went out into the battlefield with Goliath was because Goliath was maligning the God of Israel, right? His concern was the glory of God, not his own glory. Remember when he got there to the camp? That's what they're telling him. Here's what will be done for, you know. Yeah. It's not about his glory. And it wasn't about the glory for Desmond Doss. It was about serving God by serving people, right? Now, we had a dear brother, a, a dear, dear brother, Arthur Burt over in North Wales, who's now mm-hmm. going on to be with the Lord. And, I mean, we were blessed to, to know him. I, I tell you, a faithful, faithful man of God. He died at 102 a couple of years ago. He had been preaching the gospel, traveling. Up to oh, when he was 101. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, did you go to meet him in here in Florida? Yes. yes. He was 101 years old at that point. He's mm-hmm. still traveling, right? Strong man. Strong, mm-hmm. strong in the Lord. And yes. The strength of his might, yes. I'll tell you what. But, and he always proclaimed, and rightly so, what he called the, the, death, the death of the one man show mm-hmm. in Christianity. Yes. All right? Because he saw something that's all too true that within a church it's, it, it seems to be one person gets glorified in ministries you know somebody gets so elevated because the focus becomes on them right. that's not what I'm talking about but when I'm talking about being the one no. and I assure you that is not what God is talking about no. when he's talking about the one right it's not about one right but you were in the military. Did you ever march? Yeah. You know, you always started on your left foot? Yeah. You left, you left, mm-hmm. you left, right. <laughs> Was it fun? <laughs> Not really. Not really. It may be the lowly left foot that takes the first step that starts the entire body in motion. Mm. That. You understand that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. 
something has to start the body in motion. Mm. When you're in the military, with all the power of the military, it's one step by the left foot that, that starts, starts the movement. So the question becomes, are you the one? Mm. Um, verse 53, I'm going to read 53 to 56. The sons of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and plundered their camps. Then David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his weapons in his tent. Now when Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this young man? And Abner said, by your life, O king, I do not know. So the king said, you inquire whose son the youth is. Was King Saul just forgetful or was he going mad? I think he saw him for the first time. Well, no, he had, he had, let me, let's be real careful about words, okay? Mm. He had encountered David many times. Yes. Okay? He had had David brought to him, but he may not have seen him. Mm -hmm. Because I will tell you that it's easy, and I mean, I've experienced this. Uh, I, I, I just say that I grew up in, in, in an environment where I encountered many, many super wealthy, super famous people. And oftentimes it's amazing. They could meet people and never see them. Right. Because they're just insignificant. So to King Saul, David may have been insignificant mm -hmm. enough that he could look at him and not see him. Right. You understand how that happens, yes, right? Absolutely. Which is not so in the kingdom of God. There is no so nobody in the kingdom of God so insignificant that God's eyes are not fixed on him when our eyes are fixed on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Right? But in the world, that's a, that's a truth. It's not a good truth, but it happens to be a truth. Right? Mm -hmm. Remember, I'm going to read you two verses from the previous chapter in, verse, in chapter 16. The first verse says, part of the first verse says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? And then down in verse 23, it says, So it came about whenever the evil spirit from God came to Saul, David would take the harp and play it with his hand. David had been called to calm Saul when an evil spirit came upon him. How can an evil spirit? I, you know, I don't believe in your evil spirits inhabiting Christians. believers. Yeah. But God had, God had rejected Saul mm -hmm. because Saul had rejected God by disobedience. Mm -hmm. Okay? But David would be there in the presence of Saul to calm him. But he didn't recognize David now when he sees him, right? You know, Saul had remorse for his disobedience to the Lord. But there was no repentance. But not repentance. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to be sorry for what you've done. It's another thing to repent for what you've done. And then it's another thing. This is what John the Baptist said when people were flocking out to him in the wilderness because he was preaching repentance. Mm -hmm. But then he said to them, well, you better bear fruit in accordance to your repentance. You better feel bad about what you've done that draws you here and you better repent and say that you are sorry for what you've done. But you then you need to take action to correct that. It mm -hmm. can't keep going on, right? Because he did that, and he and God was not giving him repentance, he turned to the witch at Endor. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> right. He he went entirely in the wrong direction, and there's an important principle here, right? Paul wrote in Romans in the first chapter of Romans. He said, "And just as they did not talking about sinners, all right, mm -hmm. talking about people who will not worship God, who don't see God, right?" It's, he said, "And just as they do not see fit to acknowledge God any longer." God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Romans one twenty eight. Uh, what I'm telling you is the word, you know, that principle didn't start when, when Paul the Apostle wrote it. No. He was seeing a truth, right? So when, they, when Saul had not acknowledged God, Rejected him, he was given over to a depraved mind. So Saul, continuing in repentance to the Lord, went insane. 
And if you don't think the continued sin and disobeying God is insanity, you better get back into the word and check it out. We have the mind of Christ. We're supposed to have a sound mind. And you know what a sound mind does? It obeys God. That's right. It proclaims the lordship of God. A sound mind, like the mind of Christ, which we have been given, is set on the things above and is surrendered to the will of the Father. That's a sound mind. That's, you know, it says the whole head is sick. Isaiah said in the first chapter, mm -hmm. talking about if you're not, if your heart is not surrendered to God, if your mind is not set on the things, you've got a sick, you're, you're, you're insane. You're nuts. <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it. Okay. All right. Verse 57. So when David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the Philistine's head in his hand. You want to talk R-rated? Mm. Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse the Bethlehemite. He was from Bethlehem, the city of David, as mm -hmm. it came, right? So he became the seed of Jesus, the king of kings. Let's go to the end of the book. Revelations chapter 22, verse 16 says this. I, the, the, the book that Jesus is saying this. Mm -hmm. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. You know, it's, it's wonderful that we should be called by the name of Jesus, that we be, that we be associated with Jesus, right? Jesus was blessed to be able to say, I'm associated with David. Hmm. He was the apple of God's eye. He was. But this also goes back to the issue of when you are testifying about Jesus, when you are proclaiming the name of Jesus before men, he's going to proclaim your name, testify about you. Before the Father. I like the idea of thinking. I mean, I, 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 it's not saying this boastfully, but I mean, it's the word of God. That when I'm talking to people about Jesus, that Jesus is talking to the Father about me. Mm -hmm. What more do you want? Yeah. And if that doesn't excite you, you're not getting the big picture. Mm So I want to go back to the ones, the, the ones who can make a difference and are called forth by God to encourage us to humble greatness. Now, is that an oxymoron? Mm. Humble greatness? Yeah. <laughs> well, you see, that's, that should be our goal, is humble greatness. James wrote in his, in his letter and said, Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. When you humble yourself before God, God will lift you up. God will exalt you. And it says in Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 5 to 8, because this is really important that you get this. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's Jesus humbling himself. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Paul goes on to write in verses 9 to 11, for this reason also God highly exalted him. And bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that in the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That's true, humble greatness. Mm. When you've humbled yourself, God will exalt you. Yes. You know, think about this in Hebrews 12. You know, we've talked, we've talked about Hebrews 11 and Hebrews 12 a lot during the course of this study. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the beginning of Hebrews 12, it starts this way. Therefore, 
since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance in the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the, of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It's all about the ones. It was all about one, Jesus. He is the one. The one. But David was one of the ones. Mm -hmm. All right? But if you go to Hebrews 12, that great cloud of witnesses, it talks about Abraham who went when he was called, not even knowing where he's going, mm -hmm. who offered up his son, Isaac, when he was called by God to do so. Now, God gave him the substitution, his own son, right? Yes. He, he supplied the sacrifice. He was, But Abraham was one, one man that God said, I'm going to build this family of God on, on him. Isn't that mm -hmm. right? Think about Joseph, okay, who God said, gave him a vision mm -hmm. of how he would be exalted at the end. The end of a matter is better than the beginning. But then his brothers throw him down a well, sell him off into slavery, all right? But God used him to save his brothers, to save all of Egypt, to save the people of God, to save his brothers. One, mm -hmm. one who's willing. When, what's the worst thing that ever happened on the face of this earth? What's the most destructive thing? That's right. The flood. <laughs> well, <clears throat> talk about R-rated. That wiped out yeah. virtually all yeah. of humankind. I was going to say the Garden of Eden. And where's a I was going to say Noah. <laughs> <laughs> well. It wiped out all except for But it was by people. one man's faith. Yes. Noah built an ark. That's right. By faith, right? Think about Moses. It says that Moses was the most humble man there was. But it was one man. God called him to that burning bush and used him. You, I'm telling you, how many does it take? One, all right? Paul, the apostle Paul, who was Saul of Tarsus, God called him. He turned the world upside down. I mean, the Roman army, the most powerful force, the Roman Empire on earth, Paul turned it upside down. One man filled with the spirit of God, filled with the word of God, filled with the love of God. If you have that same thing, and don't you? Yes. God can use you to change other lives. Well, it says, and what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, mm -hmm. Samson, Jephthah, one person. Samson. You know, Paul says, let a man examine himself. So the question becomes, are you the one? Because that we need, there's, because there's nobody now. There's no one now that's changing what's going on. Well, are you the one? Just remember this. God chooses the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise. God uses the weak so that his power can be perfect and seen. Paul said, let a man examine himself. Are you that one? Or are you sitting on the mountain, all dressed up like soldiers, singing the war songs, sending reports of the battle that's not even going on, and living in fear of the enemy? Remember, there's no partiality with God. He's no respecter of persons. I challenge you, and don't say this facetiously, don't say it lightly, to say like Isaiah did. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Well, God bless you. I pray that you've been touched and blessed by this study of David and Goliath. We praise you and thank you, Father, that you can use one, that you can use us, Lord God. Because it's not about us, it's about you. It's not by power nor by might, but it's by your spirit, Lord. So, Father, Speak to us. Speak to us individually, Lord. Build that faith in us, Lord God, that we stand at the ready to serve you however you desire, however you desire, Lord God. Use us 
to move others in Jesus' name. Well, till next time, God bless you and goodbye. Bye.